And it's always a train. It's always the train going by. Okay, all right. Welcome to HortTube. My name is John Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do pretty much every Sunday. You can ask gardening questions down in the comment section below the video, and that's where your question resides. And then I go through and pick each week uh, some number of them uh, to, to answer. There's always way more, way more questions than I can answer in one of these videos, so I appreciate your participation. Uh, and I hope you guys continue to continue to ask questions going forward. I tend to try, I try to pick ones that are somewhat relevant uh, to whatever time of year it is uh, as I'm doing the video. Uh, this is the last day for the, to take advantage of the $60 off the Learn to Garden video series. Uh, the, um, uh, if you go over to my website, horttube.com, uh, the discount code is DEC60. And again, this is the last day to take advantage of it. Thank you very much for everyone who's um, bought it uh, during the month of December and before that as well. Um, again, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm still uh, putting up content over there on it. And I think one of the questions is gonna lead me to uh, what the next video that's going up on there is uh, in just a minute. Uh, I put up the monthly checklist video yesterday as you're watching this. Uh, just the things I have going on out here in the garden during the month of January. I'm in a short sleeve shirt. It's actually a little chilly, uh, but it's uh, it's not too bad. It's been we've had a little bit of a warm streak here in Raleigh, North Carolina, over the last week. Um, most afternoons in the uh, 60s, or somewhere right about there, uh, and then it'll you know it'll cloud over at some point, and then it gets a little chilly, but it's not too bad. We haven't been below freezing in in close to a week, uh, probably. And I actually, you know, I actually like to keep the temperature down not crazy far down but i definitely don't want things growing or waking up or anything like that so i'd prefer to be probably a little colder than this right now this week between christmas and about the 15th of january or so i like to be pretty cold not record breaking cold or anything like that but definitely somewhere in our normal average cold winter just to keep everything asleep and put it in the cycle it's supposed to be in but uh this has the potential to have a little bit of, you know, some, some bulbs to continue to grow that are starting to break the ground and that kind of thing. Um, so I'd like for it to get a little colder. Uh, let's see. Um, last week I also commented, um, so there had been a comment about the secret of the, the, the growth of this channel or whatever, and I made some comments on it, and then you guys came back and made all kinds of kind comments. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your great comments there. That video went up on Christmas Eve last week, and this one's going up on New Year's Eve. So Happy New Year, and again, Merry Christmas, and um, uh, you know all those all those kinds of things. I have been busy. I'm about to get some questions, but it has been crazy since we got back from that trip. I've had several things to fix in the house. I've had I bought a stove. I've had to replace a stove, which I needed to. It was it was coming. Several other things here. The, the garden had to be cleaned up after being out of town for two months. We've kind of really jumped all in in some corners here in the last few weeks and tried to get it where I can shoot wider angles uh, in this garden. That's kind of the goal of the year is to just be able to film whichever direction and have it look good uh, on our way to doing that. And then my son's been in Germany for over a year with his job and he's back. And so I helped him move into his apartment. I had put all, we had put all his stuff in storage while he was gone. I just helped him move into his apartment. And then my mom is moving uh, from house to house. And so I've been helping her move and she had embedded herself deeply in the place that she was. And so it has taken a lot of effort uh, to get her moved. So it's just been the wildest, just absolute wild time here around the, uh, around the holidays here. So uh, anyway, just, just, I, I don't even know why I just told you guys that. All right, here we go. Uh, some questions from last week's video. Somebody has a 15 foot tall crepe myrtle. Uh, they wanna know if it's tall enough to put some azaleas underneath. Yeah, you can absolutely underplant uh, that crepe myrtle with some lower growing shrubs. You probably wanna make sure you're just planting things that are getting like three feet. So pick the azalea wisely because there are azaleas that can get you know, 10 feet. Um, and then ones that are super, super small like gumpos. The one thing I will point out about planting anything uh, underneath a um, uh, crepe myrtle is that they tend to have aphids and the secretion from the aphids drop onto everything underneath it and then you get this black film 
that go on all the leaves of the things that are under your crepe myrtle. And we call that sooty mold, which is just, it's literally the mold on aphid poo. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Uh, and uh, it can make plants underneath them unattractive. So if you know that that, not all crepe myrtles get aphids, but a lot do. And so, you know, keep that in mind. It's within the realm of possibility. The plants that are planted underneath it won't be all that attractive um, in time. And so if you ever, if you got any of you who have a crepe myrtle that that's happening where you see black, either on the leaves of the crepe myrtles it's, uh, uh, itself, where it's dropping onto those leaves or the plants that are planted underneath, um, that's what that is. Somebody asked if any of the Southern Living Plant Collection plants that we unboxed in that video two weeks ago are deer resistant. Uh, so there were plants in those two big boxes from the Southern Living Plant Collection, better boxwood. Uh, there was an encore azalea in there and a sunset. So a few things from the sunset Western plant collection as well, sunset plant collection. So it was a mixture of things, but it was mostly Southern Living Plant Collection things. Uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff that was in those boxes are considered deer resistant. I am more and more careful over the years about saying anything is deer proof. I just don't think, you know, I may have one thing here that's deer proof, but uh, I'm, I'm really careful with that. I mean, Nandinas are considered very, very deer resistant. I had somebody the other day say that they're you know, their Nandinas get eaten all the time. And I think deer get into a safe place. Uh, the mother shows the deer, you know, the, you know the, the, they show them what to eat and then that's what they eat. And so they'll eat things that, we, that are unexpected. You know, we expect boxwoods are pretty much deer proof. Uh, maybe some boxwoods somewhere. I, any, every time I say this, somebody now is gonna say, no, the deer eat theirs. Uh, but boxwoods are considered very deer resistant. We'll call it that. Um, Loripetalum, this purple daydream Loripetalum, definitely uh, deer resistant. Uh, oleander might be the closest thing to deer proof that I pulled out of the box, and mainly because it's poisonous. Uh, so I don't think that they'll be, uh, I don't think they'll be snacking on that. Uh, I've got a gardenia that I pulled out of the box. Things with fragrant flowers and fragrant foliage tend to be good ideas. I pulled a. Um, there was a uh, cephalotaxis in the box. There was a rosemary in the box. Again, rosemary is going to have that scented foliage uh, that's usually good uh, at combating. At you know, the deer won't eat them. So there were a few things. Yeah, there are a few things in the box. But again, I'm really less and less I talk about it because you know, for, for every again, every time I bring up something and say it's pretty, you know, considered very deer resistant or something like that, somebody's going to say deer eat it. Uh, abelia or another one tend to be there's a larger one right there i could have just pointed to that one that's in the ground but here's one in a container uh are considered deer resistant i've got an indian hawthorn uh deer go to town on indian hawthorns <laughs> for sure if you have deer problems indian hawthorns aren't aren't, aren't going to be a good one i used to have the deer walk around everything in my nursery everything that you would think they would eat they'd go around roses to get to indian hawthorns they're like I, you know this is which I you know, absolutely love this plant. And I think for anybody who doesn't have deer pressure, it's fantastic, but deer will eat it. Uh, and there's something in it that they're just drawn to. But yes, a good amount of it is deer resistant. Again, I think that if you have deer issues, I would probably never go out and buy 15 of something and put it in. I'd probably experiment with things, you know, and see, well, they're not eating that, so I can go heavy on it or whatever. Um, that's probably the way I would approach it, even things on the deer resistant list. Okay, somebody said they noticed the HT on the shed in a video the other day. There is, when I, when, when I built the shed, I put a little HT on there for hort tube. But yes, um, that's, that's actually what it stands for back there. Somebody wanted to know if they can tree form a copper top viburnum. So that's a sweet viburnum. Uh, just so happens I have like one of every kind of plant <laughs> near me right now. Uh, this, uh, yes, this can absolutely be tree formed. And these kinds of things will kind of tree form themselves in time. These really fast growing leafy evergreen plants, if you're not doing a lot of top pruning on them, they will eventually thin at the bottom just because they're not getting light to penetrate all the way down to the bottom of the plant. So yes, uh, you can definitely tree form that copper top viburnum. It'll take a few years to get reasonable height on it. And then you can just select a few main branches that you want to start cleaning up and you can lift it up uh, over time for sure. And you know, any of my, 
Osmanthus over here and Laura Petalum and my Sunshine Ligustrum. I can see the bottoms of all of those plants because I've let them get a little height on them now and they're shading the bottom of the plant out. So I'm gonna go across here because I don't want them tree formed, that group of plants, and cut them from the top in the late winter, force some growth down at the bottom. If I wanted to tree form them, I just let them continue to grow. And then I could strip off some of that very bottom growth off the main trunks and turn them into small trees. Pretty much every leafy evergreen screening shrub, uh, it's possible to do that with. And if you look at any of the videos from Ram and Tom Giberson's yard down in Athens, all of her old uh, woody shrubs are that way. They're, you know, they, they've limbed themselves up into small trees uh, at this point. Um, so somebody, how did uh, we remove the lawn to create the garden beds back here? That's a video, you know, there's a playlist on the channel called New House. And if you just go back to the earliest videos on that New House playlist, you can see how we eliminated the grassy weeds that were back here. And it was just basically, we, I took the lawn mower uh, and mowed the grass, you know, mowed it to the lowest possible setting back here, just absolutely scalped it off. And then I buried it in compost and wood chips and that took care of a lot of it that didn't kill it all but it took care of a ton of it so you know that's an approach to kill your lawn is really especially if you could do it like an august day middle late of, middle of the day with the sun on it and just scalp it to the ground you know it'll cook it off uh it'll, it'll kill a lot of it won't kill all of it but a lot of it let's see somebody had a pine tree cut down can they use it for mulch. So the pine tree was cut down and then ground up and then the stump was ground. You know, can they use those materials? Yeah, absolutely. It's great material for, for mulch um, or for using as the wood chips, you know, just to, you know, have them, have them break down. The maple that was in the front garden that was taken down, um, we uh, had the stump ground out there. I really never removed any of that material. I just spread it out and then everything that's out there has been planted into it after it broke down a little bit. So it was allowed to break down for two or three months. And then everything was planted into it. The lantana that's out there that was so crazy that I cut down, and there's a lantana question coming up about me cutting the lantana down. Um, that, uh, uh, that lantana has just gone so wild. It's literally planted in um, ground up a root material from that maple so is you know anything else that's out there in that front bed uh and have, none of it's had any problems i did let it rest a little while uh let it break down just a little bit um so somebody has wood chips all over their front landscape and they're in the process of doing exactly what i've kind of done here which is they're basically going to turn the entire thing into different garden beds and then they're going to have paths uh, in between it. And they just want to know how wide the garden paths should be. So for the main paths, they need to be the size of whatever cart you really enjoy working with. So my, uh, you know, I've got this little small cart we found on the side of the road that's allowing me to narrow my paths down. I was using a big dump uh, wheelbarrow and it was wide and it made, my, made me have to maintain paths that were a little wider than I wanted. So that little small garden cart has helped with that. So it's whatever garden cart <laughs> that you need to move around to do maintenance. Maintenance is important. It's gonna be very difficult to get into beds and weed and mulch and prune and, or just walk through and enjoy uh, if you don't have enough room to do that. But I just kind of matched it to the cart that I like to use, which is that little white cart that's sitting, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's been in a lot of videos. Uh, and that's how wide I'm going to maintain the paths. Uh, so the, those main paths get my mulch to where it needs to be. And then you can put smaller little foot paths with a few stepping stones or something into the center of a bed if you've got, you know, a bench that you want to put in or a bird feeder or, you know, whatever, bird bath. Uh, you can put in a little smaller stepping stone path or something like that. But do leave paths wide enough to work in. I'll tell you that I had a lot of landscape jobs over the years where somebody had put a six foot retaining, you know, six foot privacy fence all the way around their back garden, but only put a gate on one side. And then we would come in and mulch or something and have to walk mulch all the way around, you know, or use a piece of equipment, whatever we were doing. But we had to go way around to do maintenance. So even thinking that was something like that, if you're putting a fence in, it needs to have a gate on both sides so that 
maintenance can be done easier uh, in the future. But yeah, you want to think about maintenance. And that, that part of that Learn to Garden video series, one of the early videos was, how are you going to maintain it? You know, think that through at the beginning. Uh, because later on it gets more and more difficult as things grow and fill in uh, to maintain them easily. Uh, so I said, I mentioned Mance uh, last week, which is the, uh, uh, a nursery trade show that happens the, typically the second, the second week of uh, January every year. It's kind of the kickoff nursery event, nursery uh, trade show uh, and it's probably it's the biggest one that's for kind of woody plants because it's in January. Not a lot of flowers there. There'll be some flowering things there. A lot of the a lot of the brands will force some things and bring some things in flower, but it's more woody shrubs and trees. And it's where garden centers and landscapers uh, and garden writers go and kind of see what's coming, uh, what the new plants are going to be. I'm introducing some new plants at an event that week and. Uh, you know, with, with a couple other people and uh, doing some sort of new plant showcase thing that I got asked to do. I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> it's a week and a half from now. Uh, and they, they just wanted to know if it was open to the public. Yeah, you can go. And I had somebody uh, a couple of years ago, one of the uh, subscribers to the channel um, actually came in uh, and said, hello, there's nothing to see there. I mean, there's nothing to buy. It's just, it's, you know, it's, it's really, uh, some of it is new plants that we're going to see in the future and they're trying basically like as a plant brand as the southern living plant collection trying to get some of the trying to introduce some of these new plants to growers and then it's a whole lot of nurserymen there that are wholesale growers that are trying to sell to garden centers uh, across the whole country and landscapers and that kind of thing so that's that's kind of what it is there are better shows to go to as homeowners for sure uh, for sure uh, than that particular show and I, that I think you'd get more out of that are meant more for the end user rather than, you know, the nurseryman, the nursery trade. Uh, but it is, it, it, you can go. Uh, I don't know how much it cost, honestly. Um, I have luckily never had to pay <laughs> for a ticket. Uh, so I don't really know. I don't know how much that, I don't know how much it is. It's like two and a half day event it's a big place the baltimore you know the baltimore convention center is gigantic and it is absolutely chock-a-block full of plants uh and equipment for the nursery trade uh for the nursery trade okay uh so somebody said it's predicted to be colder and wetter wetter this winter anything to, that you should do to prepare no i don't even think i don't know that they can predict anything more than six or seven days out and thus far we've been milder and, and when I see the, the little bit of forecasting I would trust right now, it's not, it's, it's staying pretty mild here. You know, I don't know what it is in Michigan or Wisconsin or any place like that, but at least here, it looks like we're gonna, you know, skirt through at least the beginning of what should be the worst of the winter without really much of an issue. That doesn't mean it won't drop colder later. So I don't, pre I'm always prepared to cover the marginal things that I have in my garden. So, you know, I got a fat hedra that's beautiful over here. I, I got marginal things out here. I've talked about them in videos. I have a cover that corresponds to that marginal plant uh, for sure if I need to cover it. So that's one way that I'm prepared. The other thing about water in the winter time, and I pointed this out in the uh, monthly checklist video, is I would examine your garden after we've gotten lots of rain in the winter time and see where areas that are more likely to stay wet in the winter. Because so I think a lot of times we plant mid to late spring or we're planting during the summer. We're doing a lot of our garden work in the early fall and that's you know drier times typically, uh, no matter where you live, drier times or it dries out faster because it's hotter. Uh, and then, you know, January can roll around and it can be really super wet in some of the spaces in our garden. So pay attention to that, uh, regardless of whatever this winter does or the next month does. Do be paying attention to your winter wet areas because some of our plants that go dormant wouldn't like to go dormant in those kinds of spaces. They wouldn't, when they can't use the water, um, you know, they're not very, uh, not very good. So do it, you know, examine your garden all months of the year. You know, how the sun changes during the winter time. You know, it's on a low angle here this time of year and I'm getting some sun on some things I wouldn't get other times of the year. I showed the golden Oakland holly. It's got its best color in the winter time because it's getting its best sunlight in the winter time, but it's a little greener in the summer 
because uh, I've got it under this giant oak tree back here. So just, you know, think about, think about things like that. It, you know, your garden does evolve as the seasons evolve. Okay, I skipped a bunch of questions on this page. Okay, uh, so, okay, so the reason I have on my Cup of Joe uh, t-shirt, somebody did say down in the comments, uh, rest in peace, Dave Sullivan. Uh, the coffee shop that I've gone to uh, since 1991, literally since it opened in 1991, is about three blocks from me. It's called Cup of Joe. It's just my local my local coffee shop and uh, my whole neighborhood's kind of local coffee shop and literally every graduate of NC State since 1991's uh, local coffee shop and uh, it's kind of a uh, kind of a big you know kind of a big thing here and uh, one of the owners unexpectedly died in his sleep uh, last week and it's somebody I see every single day so if I'm home in Raleigh, I have coffee at Cup of Joe literally every day. And so this is just somebody that I've, you know, since as long as I can remember, you know, I go in and, you know, he's a quiet person, you know, so you're not, you know, not a talkative, you know, type of person, but he made a giant impact on a lot of people. It's a great, lo great local business. It's still open. I mean, it's, you know, I had, had coffee there today. Uh, had a giant memorial earlier this week and tons. I mean, it's just, you couldn't park. Uh, to go. I mean, it was just, you know, incredible. It's amazing how somebody who's not a vocal person, you know, just kind of a silent, you know, kind of a quiet, kind of a quiet reserved person could have that much impact on so many people. But anyway, love my coffee shop uh, down the street. And that's why I have my Cup of Joe t-shirt on. And somebody had said, rest in peace, Dave Sullivan. And so uh, I agree. Um, kind of a, you know, kind of a strange thing to talk to somebody one morning and then the next morning they're not there and you don't know why they're there until later that day. Uh, and he's literally there every day. Uh, so that was, you know, that happened. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I get these questions about using, and I'll transition the coffee shop into coffee grounds. I've answered this question a bunch of times about throwing coffee grounds or any of the other things that you hear that you can throw out in your garden. Um, yes, you can use, you know, any of these organic materials as, mulch or compost, some of them may have nitrogen, some of them may have, be heavy in phosphorus or whatever. Just spread the things out far and wide. You know, I wouldn't go and dump it on the same plant <laughs> over and over and over again. You know, you may have some long-term long negative impact on dumping it in the same spot. But if you want to dump your coffee grounds in your garden, absolutely, they, are, they do have uh, nutrients that your plants can use. Just spread it out far and wide. Uh, let's see. So, okay, so somebody asked if lantanas in Zone 7 Tennessee are annual or perennial. Uh, and they asked the question because they wanted to know if they should go ahead and dig them completely out uh, after, you know, or, or let them wait and come back. So there are Zone 7 perennial lantanas. I don't know what lantanas you purchased. So I have, you know, there's New Gold, uh, Chapel Hill Gold, uh, or Chapel Hill Yellow, uh, Miss Huff, Carlos, I've given a list in the past of several lantanas that are pretty reliable in zone seven. Part of it is, is when they were planted during the year. So if you planted them way back in the spring and they had a whole season under their belt and then they went to sleep in kind of a normal way where it just, this temperature backed off slowly and they went to sleep rather than like going from 60 to, to 10, uh, they're likely going to come back. Uh, if it's one of those varieties that's already, I, again, I don't know what, what you have. So there are ones that would work. They need to be planted early in the season. The first year they're in the ground, I wouldn't cut them back until you're actually seeing some growth, new growth on them that following season. Uh, so you can wait it out. Uh, the pr only problem with waiting for lantana is it's one of the last perennials to wake up. Like, like, I mean, they're, they are, you know, my average last frost date is April 15th here. It'll be May before I see the lantana uh, waking up. And it's usually well into June before they're blooming in the deeper south much earlier than that. But for me, it's not, heck, they don't even go to sleep in the really deep south. But here it's pretty late when they wake up. Okay, so somebody put some blush pink nandinas uh, under a river birch and the nandinas are shrinking uh, and they wanted to know are they goners well i don't know how much they've shrunk at this point um i've got a lemon this is a lemon lime nandina uh, this is a sterile one blush pink 
is also a stereo one. Uh, Blush Pink is nice because it's like firepower. It'll turn bright red in the winter time, like firepower. But then when it, it's new foliage comes in the spring, it has this pink hue to it. Um, but I like Blush Pink a lot. And it's again, it's a stereo one. It's not invasive like some of our other uh, Nandinas. Um, planting under river birches is just hard. Uh, it's another plant that gets aphids and will give you the, uh, the sooty mold problem. And then it has these incredible root system that's so hard to plant around. They're so hard to garden with. Uh, if I didn't, you know, I had a river birch at the old house, but I put it way away to the back line where it wouldn't get involved and, you know, other things that still tries to get involved because they're so aggressive rooting. What you'll see in a river birch is when they come out in the spring, they'll grow like six feet really, really quickly. And then they start losing leaves. So we have, there's a birch right here at the end of the street. It's so predictable every year. It'll come out, grow, 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 grow. As soon as it gets resistance, either heat, runs out of water, whatever, it drops about half its leaves really quickly. It's trying to outcompete everything around it. So it's just, it's just what it does. It's just like it's, <laughs> its thing. Its thing is to outcompete everything around it uh, in order to get into the sun, to be, make sure it owns the sunlight. And so I, I just don't like gardening with them, period. <laughs> but... Uh, it, you know, I don't know about your, I have no idea on these Nandinas. What you're going to have to do though, if you do plant around an established birch is you're going to have to water for some period of time. You might raise them up a little bit, give them a little bit of a head start, you know, out into some, uh, compost and other things, but very difficult long-term. Uh, the best thing to do is to plant your birch and the other things that you want with your birch at the exact same time so that they, so that they grow together and root in together. Once the birch owns the space, it kind of owns the space. Um, okay, let's see. Um, somebody wants a tree close to their house uh, with morning sun and afternoon shade and wants something fast growing. I don't know how fast a growing thing you want next to your house, but because um, uh, sometimes fast growing things are two things. Sometimes very fast growing things are very short lived. I would put willows in that category. You know, they tend to just burn themselves out. Uh, and from that rapid growth thing I was talking about. And then uh, the other thing is, um, you know, very fast growing trees are probably going to keep growing. <laughs> you know, they're not going to have an off switch if it's close to your house. Uh, most of the morning sun, afternoon shade trees are some of our good, really good natives like red buds. Like the weeping red bud I have back here is a good example. And it's pretty fast growing. Um, that will take that morning sun, afternoon shade, dogwoods, uh, native, our native fringe tree. I've got a Chinese fringe tree. It probably is a little slightly out of the frame, but there's an American fringe tree. A lot of our native ornamental trees are good with that morning sun, afternoon shade uh, thing. It's kind of where they dominate the forest. It's typically right on the edge uh, of the forest. So those are some um, good examples. And that's one thing I was going to say. My, I've got the learn to garden video that I've got shot and edited and up. And I, you guys should, the, those of you who are subscribed to the learn to garden video series, will get an email in the next few days about it. I have a tree video going up on there and I talk about going and picking out a tree. I talk about how to shop for trees, how to pick the right tree. Uh, we went through, you know, there's just a process of thinking through, you know, it, trees I consider lifetime pieces in the garden. You know, a lot of these shrubs, after 15, 20, 25 years, they just get tired looking uh, and they either need a really hard pruning to reset them or sometimes they just need to come out. There's a lot, there's newer versions of the same thing uh, that are better or improved, whatever. Trees, I'm thinking about planting them per as permanent pieces. And so I want to make sure, and, and lots are getting smaller, houses are getting bigger, and we don't have the kind of space to pick out a bunch of trees. And so it gets more and more important to pick the right tree for you, the right tree for the space. Uh, and that's what the video on the Learn to Garden video series will be that you guys will see in the next few days who, uh, who have that. Uh, let's see. And again, for this particular question, a lot of our native uh, ornamental trees are going to be your friend. Dogwoods, red buds, you know, fringe tree. Um, I'm missing a few things, I'm sure, but th those, those will work for sure. 
Um, somebody wants to transplant their sunshine ligustrum in zone 7b or 8a in Greensboro. In Greensboro, I'd probably wait until later in the winter to do it. You could be a little colder uh, than us. Greensboro is about an hour west of us, and it's uh, they got them in 7b, 8a on the map, and there's just no way. There's absolutely no way. I can look at any night here. I was 23 is the lowest temperature we've been so far. If we've been 23, I bet Greensboro's been four degrees colder than that uh, minimum. So, you know, it's got to be a half a zone, at least a, at least a half a zone difference uh, between us and, uh, and Greensboro. But uh, I would wait till a little bit later. You could do it now. You could absolutely do it now. But as part of moving it, I'd want to cut it back uh, and doing, bo doing both of them at the same time in mid early to mid-March would be better, I think. Okay, um, so somebody said they haven't had any frost in, in Texas where they are and their tomatoes are still alive. Yeah, it's not surprising. We've only had maybe eight nights below freezing and only probably three that were real killing frost, you know, where they were below, you know, 28. You know, like those, those 29, 30, 31 degree nights, which are below freezing are you know, it only hang, the temperature only hangs out there for an hour or two, and sometimes a lot of things can survive that, uh, that, that wouldn't like it. They don't like it, but they can survive it. And those tomatoes are perennials, actually. You know, we treat them as annuals, but they are perennials. You could actually, what I thought about when I read that question was you could actually take some cuttings uh, on those tomatoes if they're still in good enough shape and actually root them and make more of that one for this next year if you wanted to just have some fun uh, rooting some tomatoes. Let's see, um, they root really, really easily. Somebody talked about using the finger test to test soil moisture. And, um, you know, they thought about, you know, when you put your finger down in the soil just to see if it's moist, and I, this is how I say to check, you know, if something actually needs to be watered. Sometimes just the coolness of the soil makes it feel damp. Uh, and then they said it might also help people to know that the soil should stick to their finger. So if you, if you dig around and come back and the soil stuck to your finger, it may be helpful. You know, that, that's probably a better indicator that its soil's actually moist. If you're struggling with this, I would just get a moisture, you know, a, a, a meter that can, can gauge this. I'll link one down below uh, the video. You know, it's for $14, $15, you can get a probe that goes in the ground and tells you if the ground, you know, how the soil moisture, um, if you're, you know, confused by it otherwise. It is, watering is the hardest thing. Um, there's no question about that. Overall, it's the hardest thing to manage because I want to use the least amount of water possible. What's the least amount of water I can use and still have the garden look good? You know, that is absolutely my, my end goal here uh, for watering. Sometimes that can be pushed to a limit where, you know, it's not good for the plants. Uh, let's see, um, where do we store our carts and wagons? <laughs> right there in the path, <laughs> the two sitting on top of one another. We're actually clearing out the other side of the building and our, our uh, carts are going on the back side of that building. It's another one of these. I've had them on this side of the building, which doesn't allow me to, uh, again, I'm trying to come out here and have wide angles. And if you'll notice the video from yesterday, uh, I shot in much wider angles just trying to show off more of the garden in a single shot. That gets difficult when your carts and things are laying all over the place. So they're going to the other side of the building. I've in the process of clearing a space over there for that. But I'm thinking through those things right now because we've had, this has been a nonstop construction event for three years. And then I'm out of town four out of 12 months, probably, you know, and so there's a mess here and there always trying to check off those last boxes like that of organization, I guess. Should the green tape be removed from staked fruit trees? So the stretchy green tape, if you bought a tree that's staked before, you've probably seen the stretchy green tape that they use to tie the tree onto the bamboo stake or metal stake or whatever it is. Yes, uh, you do need to take it off at some point, but it doesn't mean that this tree is done being staked necessarily. So, you know, you can, t I would cut, if you think it's cutting into the tree at all, I would cut it off. If the tree still is wonky in some way and still continues to need to be tied up, just tie it in a different spot. So regardless of whether you're, so I've, this weeping red bud is gonna have to be staked pretty much permanently. Uh, it's just for its own good. 
it needs to be staked forever. Uh, the plastic tie that I have on here, I need to put a new one on. So I'll just cut that off and put a new one on because otherwise it's going to cut into that tree uh, over, some, over some period of time. So yes, uh, cut it off and replace it if the tree is still, you know, needs some sort of adjustment. Someone has a perlite mist uh, bed table uh, and they're anxious to root something. So they've built a, I think it was a four by six table or two by two by six table. I don't remember now. I should have written that part down. Uh, they built a table. They've got per, uh, a little bit of perlite in the bottom of it. They're going to be sticking cuttings in and then they've got a mist system that's going to go over top of it. So I've shown, I've got lots of propagation videos on the channel. If you want to learn how to propagate plants, make new plants from the, make free plants. Okay. Uh, they want to know if there's anything that they could be rooting now. This is a great time to be rooting conifers. So Arborvita, you'll notice on a lot of your uh, Arborvita this time of year, they're actually growing, uh, depending on how warm it's been in your area. So most of the rooting of things like green giant Arborvita and it, uh, any of the eastern Arborvita like emerald or DeGroots or anything like that, I would try conifers uh, in the dead of winter like this and wait for some semi-hardwood cuttings on all your other stuff, maybe toward May, June, July, are gonna be best on those things. Somebody asked me about stained mulches or dyed mulches, brown mulch, black mulch, red mulch, all those things. Wondered if they had any negative impact. They shouldn't. Those are supposed to be organic things that they're dyeing that mulch with. Uh, they're not my thing, uh, for sure. Uh, I, I've never, uh, never been drawn to the red mulch craze <laughs> at all. Uh, I had, had somebody say that they're uh, HOA required black mulch for everyone somewhere. And every time I see, and somebody's gonna, of course, I mean, gonna comment down below that they use black mulch and they love it and their plants love it. But a lot of times I'll see black mulch and I don't see the plants performing as well. And I think maybe there's a heating up of that. You know, the mulch, I'm putting down hardwood mulch, which has a dark color, but the sun pretty quickly bleaches it. So the point of these dyed mulches is to prevent that bleaching from happening to keep their mulch color longer. Well, that bleaching of that mulch is also something that's allowing the roots to stay cooler on my plants during the summertime. By keeping it red or black or dark brown is going to keep those roots almost too hot uh, during the winter and kind of counteract the fact that mulch should be keeping the roots slightly cooler uh, during the summertime. Because we've got, we got fibrous roots on most of these plants up in the top three, four inches of soil. So I like that bleaching. It's not as, again, it's not as attractive, um, you know, as, as a darker mulch would be, but I've never been drawn to them. I also think that a lot of the bagged dyed mulches are, the dye is almost over, uh, is almost hiding the fact that it's not great quality material, that it's like chipped up uh, pallets and you know other things uh, making up that mulch uh, and so you know the dye is almost a cover for the fact that it's not a quality material. Again if you like red mulch or brown mulch I said the same thing about cutting crepe myrtles last week the crepe murder thing and not my business I don't care uh, I, I observe it it's not my and I go it's not my thing but I don't go that person is crazy for using brown mulch or red mulch or black mulch I don't care it makes no difference to my life whatsoever. If it makes that person happy, then, then go for it. Again, I do think that the mulch is, the bleaching of the mulch is probably protecting from some heat related stress on the roots. Okay. Uh, so that's a pretty good question. They're in, somebody's in zone seven B Atlanta area, probably eight A now, if you're in that Atlanta area, um, at what temp or th based on the new map, um, at what temp should a plant be covered? Uh, five degrees, 25 degrees. Um, okay, so this question, so if you had something like, if you're in zone 7B and you're, you know, have forsythia planted and they're completely dormant right now, you know, they're just, you know, or you have some sort of maple, you know, or some sort of thing that's lost its leaves for the deciduous plants that are dormant, you wouldn't have to cover them at any temperature. The only, the temperature you cover a plant at is the temperature that would kill that particular plant or damage that particular plant or a wind that would damage that particular plant. So it's really impossible to answer like for your entire garden. Uh, if I came to your garden in the Atlanta area, I would say there's probably 50 
to 70% of the plants that are in your garden, even if you were 10 degrees below our historic average, let's say you had zero degrees or something like that, or negative two uh, degrees, something crazy, Fahrenheit for your area, 70% of the plants are gonna be fine. But 30% of the plants, uh, things like that are barely zone seven hardy, uh, and those things are gonna be something like that Laura Petalum I showed, or maybe one of the um, you know, Mahonias that are barely zone seven hardy. Uh, my, uh, uh, this Mojo Pittosporum would absolutely be in trouble. It's barely zone seven hardy. Uh, and this is one that I have to think about in this container. If it's, I don't want this container to freeze solid. So there are plants out here. It'd be based on certain temperatures, you know, coming down. So when I get below 20 because of the crazy thing I've done in this garden, there's some plants that are going to have to start to be protected. When I would get, by the time I got down to zero, I'd have quite a few things uh, protected. But most folks, um, most of the things you have in your garden, you you can the the you can go five or 10 degrees below your historic averages and most things are gonna be fine. And a lot of it has to do with how long the age of the plant. So much of this is the age of the plant. If you have newly planted things in your garden, they are not in, let's say something that says, it's hardy from seven, you know, zone seven to 10. You're in zone seven. You plant that thing in October, it may not be zone seven hardy. That It may not be hardy down to 10 degrees that first winter. Uh, but if it's been in the ground for five years, it may be hardy down to zero or below zero. Uh, so again, the age of the plants matter as well. You know, just having newly planted things are going to be more susceptible. So I'd be prepared to cover those, even if you got anywhere near your historic lows of, you know, 10 degrees or five degrees, you know, average lows. Um, so somebody asked if the Stellar Ruby, I, was, I filmed last week with the palm uh, in the background and we'll slide around to the palm. They wanted to know if that, uh, if that plant that's right behind it right there is the Stellar Ruby Magnolia, right? That's a, that's, this is a giant ligustrum on my neighbor's property that has probably 1 million seeds on it. So that'll be, that'll be plenty of weeds uh, to go around, but that's a Stellar Ruby Magnolia behind it. I showed it in another video earlier this week. Yes, that thing is absolutely, that thing's absolutely beautiful. Another zone seven, let me keep sliding this around a bit, sorry. Uh, another zone seven hardy plant that I now think I wouldn't think about protecting it. Um, I think it'll be absolutely fine now, but that first season or two, I probably, here, I got another really small one in a container right here. This one needs protection. Uh, so that's an, another thing you have to think about. So somebody has some Arborvita, and I think they were in the Atlanta area as well. They had planted a bunch of things, but some of their Arborvita had turned a little bit, or had turned brown. So that, that's, do I have one? Um, I don't, I don't, but a lot of Arborvita will turn, get a brownish hue to them in the winter time. So I, you know, I, I don't, you won't know if they're actually damaged until the other side of, of winter when they start to green back up. But some, you'll get an ambering color on a lot of boxwoods, especially Japanese boxwoods, and then a lot of conifers, especially Arborvita, can, can take on different hues. Now, if they're under stress, uh, it might show up a little more. So let's say it was really, really dry three weeks ago. We finally gotten some rain here, but back when it was dry, and then it initially got cold, that amber color that shows up in them would probably be a little heavier uh, in a year where they were under some sort of stress. Uh, so newly planted, dry, um, you know, first cold of the season, they may absolutely be fine. Um, it's not atypical for Arborvita to turn um, rusty kind of color during the winter time, especially in more Northern areas. Somebody asked if lawns always go dormant um, no, I mean, if it's winter time and your lawn is dormant, you either have Bermuda, Centipede, Zoysia, St. Augustine, one of those. And in the South, we tend to have the, you know, those types of grasses. So they're, 
they're happy when it's hotter during the year and then they go completely dormant, you know, die back basically to the root and then come back from that uh, in the, in the uh, early spring. The cool season grasses, the uh, bluegrass, uh, fescue, um, perennial ryegrass, you know, those tend to be, um, but they actually have a dormancy too. They just go dormant in the summer. And you can't tell because they're, they're green, but they're in like a, you know, they're not, they don't grow a whole lot. We force them to with water and fertilizer and other things, but they'd like to go into kind of a summer, summer dormancy. And then they look better typically in the cool season. So whatever you have is one of the, uh, you know, the southern grasses. A lot of those can be overseeded. You can overseed with uh, annual bluegrass, uh, or not annual bluegrass, annual ryegrass. And it's pretty inexpensive seed uh, that you can just overseed your Bermuda lawn or centipede or zoysia or St. Augustine lawn. Some years it's better than other years. Um, um, different outcomes, sometimes that blue, that, that I keep saying bluegrass, Sometimes that ryegrass can stick around too long in the spring and, and not in your, uh, has a negative impact on your other, your southern, your southern variety of grass waking up properly. But a lot of people do overseed their, uh, those types of grasses um, for the winter time. Uh, but they are, but, I mean, a lot of people though, I mean, I'm here in my area are trying to grow tall fescue. I mean, I've sold more fescue seed at garden centers that I worked at and every, you know, and put more in than you can imagine. And, you know, yeah, every fall you just redo it and redo it and redo it. Um, Cause people want that green grass, you know, year round and they're willing to have a very high water bill and a, you know, lots of fertilizer and, and other chemicals to do it. Uh, let's see, fungicides. Uh, so somebody has a 25 year old hydrangea, uh, it, they transplanted it and I guess it had root suckered over the years, meaning, you know, a branch had probably laid down somewhere and then the mulch or the leaves allowed it to root in on the stem. When they dug it up to move it, they ended up with six separate plants. Um, they want to keep those in good shape through the winter to keep the buds from, um, from, from losing the uh, flower buds during the winter time, what should they do? I just bring them in on the coldest nights if they're in containers. Um, but in any kind of mild day like I'm having right now, I'd have them outside because we want to keep them asleep. It's important that those hydrangeas stay asleep. But the nights that you know are like 28 degrees or colder, I just slide them into the garage for the night. And then as soon as you can get them back outside, that's what I would do. And that should keep those flower buds from, from uh, from dying. Last question for this week, which makes number 27. Uh, this video is probably going to be very long. Let's see. Um, this, uh, this person took some logs. They created raised beds. Okay. Um, they created, they created raised beds using logs and smaller and smaller sticks and then wood chips on top of that. Then dug holes in it basically and then used um, what they called premium garden soil and planted some plants in it. They just wanted to know if the plants would get what they need from this. Uh, this is a, a very old style of gardening called hugel culture. It's Germany and Eastern Europe and it just means mound culture the, um, or mound be mounded beds okay is what it translates to and you can just use organic material like this. Basically the wood chips and the smaller sticks are going to break down f pretty fast and supply nutrients to your plants and then the logs will take much longer to break down and supply um, and, and supply what the plants need over time. So um, I don't know. You won't know until you know. <laughs> uh, it might be that uh, this stuff breaking down is going to require a little bit of nitrogen and it could off color your plants just a little bit. It would be temporary. Uh, but you can kind of offset that by using some organic fertilizer on it. I think they are going to need a little bit of fertilizer. You know, these mounds are going to need a little bit of organic fertilizer. Um, I, I would I would definitely plan on doing that. Be careful with these premium, these garden soil type things. Uh, they're, um, you know, a lot of organic. The, the, the pile could end up staying very wet. So that's, you know, something that could happen here is that stuff instead of, instead of the wood chips and the sticks and the logs and everything breaking down properly, it could go anaerobic on you if it stays too wet. So be careful, you know, with using like a lot of peat moss or something like that as part of this strategy, because 
you don't want to create a situation where you just created a big pile of goo <laughs> that the plants have a hard time rooting in and then you know you end up with bad bacteria and bad um, fungi and that kind of thing but make sure that it's drying out between waterings and that kind of thing but this is a very old practice of gardening it works fan absolutely fantastic uh, to do this but you're gonna have to take a look at it over the season are your plants slightly off color you know that's probably telling you you're a little nitrogen deficient uh, uh, but it's a fun experiment uh, regardless and it's good you know it's uh, basically stored nutrients that will be released in a slow fashion as all that material uh, breaks down so thank you guys very much for uh, following along with the channel and again this is the very last day for the $60 discount on the learn to garden video series the all of 2024 I will continue to add content and continue to fill that in um, and uh, and also organize the videos from the main channel where you're watching right now thanks for watching